now it's time for an introduction to what an experiment actually is. So, what is a randomized controlled trial? That's the same thing as an experiment. It's just a randomized controlled trial is sort of the more technical term that makes explicit the three different elements. I want to get you as, give you a sense of why I experiments the gold standard in terms of establishing causation. And um, later on in the live session, we'll get to internal or external validity. Okay. And, and, and the aim or the learning objective is that you will be able to assess the quality of an experiment, whether it's in a business administration, um, economics more in general, or whether it's in all sorts of other uh, fields and medicine or whatever, whatever it could be, you'll learn sort of the essence of what to pay attention to in order to be sure that this is an actual experiment. Well, this is the question that we also grappled with in the, in the former video. How can we be certain that an effect is due to one specific variable? How can we be certain that it wasn't just a random um, correlation or that there aren't other factors that we haven't thought about, other variables that we hadn't thought about that actually are the key, uh, that are key. And as the chief economist at Google said there in 2016, to find out what happens when you change something, it's necessary to actually change it. That's really the, the essence of the experimental approach is that in order to be sure that something has an effect, you need to try this effect out and, and see what the results are. And, and I also refer to someone from Google just to highlight that experiments, of course, isn't just something that we as researchers carry out. Um, these numbers are even now a couple of years old, so they're probably outdated and much higher now. But at this point in time, every year, um, Google and Amazon and Netflix, etc., ran thousands and thousands of different kinds of experiments. So in that sense, you've also been exposed to a lot of experiments just by being online, because Netflix constantly tries out different ways of presenting their information to the consumer in order to see how do we get people to consume the most. Um, Jeff Bezos from Amazon even says, our success at Amazon is a function of how many experiments we do per year, per month, per week, per day. So they do this all the time. And again, of course, they also do it in a in a proper way. There's no reason to sort of do an, a half-baked experiment that doesn't work. You have to do it in, in the right way. And another illustration of this comes from, from this sort of small article here, an experiment experience that eBay had a couple of years ago. Um, basically, they had the experience that the more they changed an ad, expo the more they used ads on Google, for instance, the bigger uh, the change and the more they also s sold their products. So basically an ad in Google is, you, you probably know this, or you've, in all the other search engines, if you type in a word, there will often be an ad associated to it. So the top link here is actually not sort of a, 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 a link um, provided by your Google search as such. It's, it's an, sort of an additional ad feature that is on top of it that Google is making money on. And what eBay was experiencing is that, for instance, every month or every quarter, they were sort of increasing the number of ads they posted and the more um, ads that were exposed to human searchers, well, the more products they sold. So fantastic, their ads work, right? Well, it turns out they actually got sort of an, an, an unplanned way of testing this because in, in relation to a negotiation they had with another company, they wanted to show, well, how, how big was the effect of this, this ad? And so they shut down the ad feature. And what effect was there? Well, okay, this link says absolutely nothing. It might be overdoing it a bit, but as you can see, Visitors via the paid link versus visitors via the unpaid link, the moment the ad feature stopped, the number of visitors that went to the unpaid link that is clicked on this one, which doesn't give Google money, it's only this one here that does, just increased a lot. So um, so, so basically what eBay, and this is was at this point in time, also a very large company run by very, very qualified people. But they for years did not realize that their ads did not give them the value that they thought it, they would simply because they hadn't run an experiment to test it. So just a sort of very sort of business oriented example of the need to run an experiment, even in situations where you think you have a pretty good idea of what's going on, because you could after all be wrong. It might appear obvious as Duncan Watts would say, but it wasn't after all. So what do you, what do we do? What do companies like Amazon and Google, etc., do when they actually run an experiment? So the essence is as we often use the, the, the medicine, sort of a headache pill example, because it's, it's, it's quite intuitive. You want to find out if a headache pill is effective. So you find a number of people, let's say 100 people that have a headache. 
all have to have sort of the reasonable same kind of headache. You then randomly divide them into groups. One group gets the pill, one group doesn't get a pill. And in that way, we can then see over time, for instance, six hours, how many of the people in this group that got a pill have a headache versus how many in the group that didn't get a pill. It turns out that, that the reason why I have three distinctions here is that it turned out that there is something called a placebo effect. Just getting a pill makes you think that there might be a positive effect. So just the interaction with the doctor or the nurse or even the pharmacist can have a positive effect. So it turns out the placebo effect is actually quite substantial in terms of reducing headache. Um, it does um, in fact have a, a, a substantial effect. What we're interested in is the actual chemical effect of the content in the headache pill. That's what we're really after. We don't want to sort of identify a placebo effect. So this is how, the way we do it. We have a number of people. We randomly allocate these people into one group or another. It should not be I have the most headache, therefore I need to get into group X, or my headache isn't that bad, or I don't like pills, so let me put it down here. Then we could suddenly see other kinds of effects, that if we end up having the people with the most headache getting pills, well, that might also be most likely to get their headache reduced by a pill. So we want these groups, these three groups here, we want them to be as absolutely similar as possible. And as indicated, this little picture here of course, people shouldn't know that they're getting a placebo pill or that they don't get a pill. Or that, I mean, this is ideally people don't know which condition they're in because, again, if they know that they're in a certain kind of condition, they might adapt their behavior accordingly. And only one variable should be changed. So ideally, these people in these three different groups, they behave completely identical. Just because you get a headache pill, you don't go out and play soccer and head get the football in your head and thus increasing your risk of getting a headache. I mean, you should sort of have the same kind of behavior in all groups um, before and during and after the experiment in order to get as clean a test as possible. We'll see a bunch more examples of this as we go along. This is just to sort of really identify the, the essence of it. It's a randomized trial, so random allocation. It's a controlled trial, so we have to control that all these groups are sort of are similar in as, 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 as many ways as possible. And it's a trial or it's a randomized controlled treatment. There's only one thing that is that's being done differently. So that's the whether um, RCT, it's not an RTC, it's, it's what the RCT is, is coming from, RCT. Um, and let's take another example. That's from the O'Reilly text um, in the curriculum. So O'Reilly wanted to find out if seeing the fruits of our labor makes us more productive. So he did an experiment where he took um, a bunch of students at Harvard and randomly allocated them into two groups. In one group, well, in both groups, they had to build Lego Bionicle figures. But in one group, the, um, the figure was disassembled, so it was taken apart right after they had finished building it. So in this specific uh, group right after you've you've finished building your 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 bionicle someone is standing in front of you and taking it apart it's very clear that there's really no point to building it in the other group what is called a meaningful group it actually just means that no one took it apart so as similar setup as possible they both build legal bionicles they both get the same amount of money the, um, the question is how many are they willing to 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 build as you can see you get three dollars for the first 270 for the next 242 one etc so for how little money are you willing to build the next bionicle and it turns out as you can see in the meaningful group they were willing to build 11 in the in the other only seven so here we have another randomized controlled trial where we have a group of people randomly allocated to one group or another again they're not being asked so would you feel it annoying if someone disassembled your bionicle right in front of you and, and if they say yes, they get into the meaningful group? No, we don't want this kind of selection. We want a completely random allocation of people into one or the other group. The condition should be entirely similar. This shouldn't be sort of be happening in, 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 in sunshine while this happens in rainfall. Um, all other factors should be the same. Only one variable should be changed. The fact whether it's disassembled or not. And again, of course, we have to remember this is an average causal effect. On average, they built 11 and 7 here. But of course, there was a distribution of, of, of number of bionicles they built across individuals. So just sort of to really reiterate all these elements here, randomized control trial, we have an allocation to each treatment. So we have a group of people that we then randomly allocate to each group. Notice that the people in each group, they're not necessarily identical. 
I mean, one person can only get into one group. You can't split and copy one person and then make sure that they are completely 100% identical. We can't clone people, organizations, or whatever we're studying like that. But we can assume that we had a group of people and we then randomly allocated, for instance, via coin flip into one or the other group. They are as similar as possible. They're not going to be identical, but they are as similar as possible. One group plays it has a one kind of Bionicles condition and the other one, the other one, and we can then see the results. But the idea is that if you, because you had this random allocation to each group, then these groups are as similar as possible. Um, and for instance, you can think of it in terms of gender. Let's say you have 100 people and you divide it up into by, by a coin flip into one or the other group. If you start with 50 men and 50 women, most likely you have about 23, 24, 25, 26 or something of each in each group. It's not going to be completely identical number uh, in terms of gender, but it's going to be very, very similar just because of, of, of how randomness works when it accumulates. Here I have a picture of two classrooms because we get to a classroom example a little bit later, but just to show that if you run an experiment in a room or wherever you run your experiment, it should be completely identical. Um, a setting should be as identical as possible, you, and, and, and which then enables there to be only one treatment. There's only one thing that is different from one setting to the other. So let's try to think about this a bit. Um, and, and, and think of this example here. It's a very famous example. It was also documented and showcased on Danish TV. It's the marshmallow example. So it's an old study from, from back in, I think, the 70s, where four-year-olds were offered one marshmallow now or two marshmallows 15 minutes later. So as you can see, there's a kid sitting in the room. There's a marshmallow in front of them, and they can eat it now, or they can wait 15 minutes, and they would get two. This is a randomized control trial. You can, if you want to, just pause the video and reflect on it and, and consider whether it sort of it, it, it fulfills the, the criteria we have. Oops, there was one boy who couldn't wait. Um, who knows? Maybe they weren't telling the truth when they were promising two marshmallows later. So better eat it now, right? Um, in this situation, yeah, better hide the plate, then no one knows you ate it. Um, in this situation, it's not a randomized control trial because there was no sort of, everyone is getting the same treatment. Everyone could get two marshmallows later. So they're sort of self-selecting into either eating right away, the one, or getting two, getting an additional one later on. There was not a random allocation in terms of, um, of, of who gets how many marshmallows. So it's an exact identical setup and, and people sort of self-select into whatever outcome they end up with. You could have done an experiment by saying, so what is the impact of having to wait seven and a half minutes versus 15 minutes? That would have been saying a direct comparison. Let's take the exact same setup, put kids into a room. Some kids wait seven and a half minutes, other kids wait 15 minutes. Let's do a comparison of how many marshmallows are being eaten right away. That would, that would have been a way to say it's an experiment. So we need to make sure there is a randomization element. That's what this example is, 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 is highlighting. Um, sort of the, the randomization element. We need to randomize people into different uh, settings so there can be a variance of, 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 of treatment. So again, also the, the treatment is not identical. There is not sort of a thing that is different uh, across the situations. Okay, so let's <clears throat> take another example and read about this. It's basically a, a reference to the Bible and what could be the first documented randomized control trial if it actually is one. So again, you can pause the video and read the, the snippet that I've inserted there and, and, and think about it. Um, I'll go through it here. So the essence, that, the way that is being described in the, in the Bible is that Daniel is, is a fellow who doesn't want to eat meat and insists that it's healthier not to eat meat. The king was interested in this. Okay, how about um, we test your servants for 10 days? Um, or Daniel is proposing this. So we should test your servants, test the servants for 10 days give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink, and then we compare our appearance with that of other young men who eat the royal food, um, and then to see what's going on. So the king ends up comparing the four non-meat eaters, including Daniel, with other meat eaters. And then after 10 day, um, after this 10 day treatment, they are then compared and then to, order to assess, are those that ate meat, do they look healthier than those that did not eat meat? Um, and, and and here's there seems to be a treatment, meat or not. 
but concerning the allocation of people into each group, it, it then there is self-selection in the sense that Daniel, who came up with the proposal and who doesn't eat meat, he is himself in the non-meat eat group. So, so maybe Daniel is not eating meat because he, he already is healthy and can sort of um, get by by not eating meat. So maybe sort of the effect is coming from somewhere else. In that sense, the, the two groups are contaminated, so to speak, because there is not a complete random allocation from one in, in one group and the other group. And it could be the case that, um, that the people that ended up in the non-meat eating groups, they were already healthier in advance. They were already maybe the kind of people who sort of could uh, eat enough vegetables um, and still look healthy. So we need this random allocation and that's why this is not an actual experiment, even though it's pretty close and pretty impressive that according to the Bible, this happened at one point. Okay, let's do one more example. Um, researchers interested in the impact of rewards on behavior. So in one group, 50 people are set to do a task as many times as possible and receive one krona per task. In the other group, 50 people are to do the same task as many times as possible and are told they will receive a 1.50 krona per task and the goal is to solve 50 of them. Pause the video if you want to reflect on it, maybe you already are at the answer. Two things are going on here. We are comparing one krona per task with one and a half krona per task, but on top of that, one of the groups were told that there is a goal involved. You should solve 50 tasks. Goal setting behavior does have an impact, as you know, from organizational behavior. So the groups are not completely identical. This suggestion should also have been given to the original group in order to compare the two settings. And of course, those in one group shouldn't also shouldn't know what is happening in the other group because you might be annoyed about landing in the one krona per task if, if you could have landed in the one and a half and that was just bad luck and this annoyance could then lead you to performing more poorly or what sort of whatever effect that could be there so as highlighted here we should not we should never really know what is the treatment in other groups so if you participate in the in the COBE lab in the in our social science lab here at all university at bss that's why you should not sort of know what treatment you're getting or what treatments others are getting because that could lead to some kind of Hawthorne effect where you know you're being observed on this particular variable and, and maybe you'll adapt your behavior according to it. It's a challenge of lab experiments that we'll get back to. So, key elements. There should be a randomization process. Whatever group of people you have, you should allocate them randomly into one or the other group. Um, Next time we'll get back to, in the next video, we'll get to thinking about in the O'Reilly experiment with Bionicles, it was actually only male students from Howard that participated. So is that then still completing the criteria of randomization? Second point is you should manipulate, the treatment should have been only one variable. Comparison with control and treatment, there should only be one thing that is different. And then it should be a control setting, so everything else should be the same. So you should really make sure that if you, if you have two different groups, at two different times that you try to make them as similar as possible. Of course, nothing can be completely similar if you run one part of the experiment at 10 o'clock and the other one at 11 o'clock. Well, people at 11 will have gotten out of bed a bit later and maybe the sun is shining a little bit more so the room is lighter. I mean, it should basically and in an essence be the same. But of course, even the air that is being breathed in the room is not completely identical. You can never expect the sort of different groups to be absolutely completely identical what you're aiming for is that it should be as identical as absolutely possible. This was the essence of a randomized control trial. We'll get a bunch more examples and illustrations and also of different kinds of experiments in the coming videos and sessions. But these were the, the basics as they are.